All right, the plan for today, we definitely want to get to epsilon closure and also how we can convert from epsilon NFA into DFA. That one there would just involve some slight extension to the subset construction we did last time. And then we're going to do very simple regular expression to epsilon N of A, which is going to do one example to illustrate the idea. And this will be the second last topic for this lecture, which will be minimizing DFA. This might be a relatively new topic to some of you, since uh, you mentioned some of you actually learned in 2001, some of you did not. So we can treat it as a new topic, which is interesting. But we'll see how much we can go. We we'll definitely want to finish that before the reading week or early part on Thursday. All right, so this is where we ended up with. So this will be how we can draw. Well, these are the uh, useful scenarios to use the, use the epsilon N of A, especially the epsilon transition. And we'll see that more, okay, later. And so this will be just one example here. You can definitely study that. And some very typical question to answer very quickly, all right? When you are given this diagram here, check yourself, is this a DFA? There are different ways for you to prove or to show this is not a DFA. Number one, you have an epsilon transition, so it cannot be DFA. Number two, you can see, for example, in this state over here, you don't really have any outgoing transition, so it does not really cover the alphabet, right? So that's definitely not DFA. And is it an NFA? Not really, because you got the epsilon transition. Only for epsilon NFA you got a very special transition there, epsilon, right? Just remember. So the answer for these would be no, no, and yes. Very simple one to judge, okay? And let's now talk about some formulation, okay? And for this time, let me save time for everybody. So we're just gonna go over some definition very quickly. They are rather similar to how we define the formulation for NFA. So now the only difference is we now have the epsilon transition, right? Let's now go over the triple very quickly. Q will still be the states, same as always. And now the sigma over here is still the input uh, symbols. So we don't really consider the epsilon as part of the uh, sigma. Sigma will still be just a concrete symbol, okay? However, when we define the uh, transition function here, the delta, you can see the way we do it. We still got a cross product between what can be taken as transition here. So you can see the sigma and the epsilon symbol, they are separate. But we kind of union them together. That's the way, the way we treat it. And then you can still produce a set of states. So this part is same as NFA, right? which can be empty. Right? For that one, just notice the difference. And also initial state, just one. And also accepting states will just be uh, some set of states. All right, so that's the formulation. All right, hopefully that's straightforward. And we're just gonna do some very simple exercise for you guys, very simple ones, right? Um, just one or two cells and then we can move on. This will be how you can draw the transition table for the epsilon NFA over here. Let's say you've, if you're given the question to show the transition table. And of course, you still got the different input symbol right here. So you can think about these guys over here are the sigma. And this is the special symbol only for epsilon N of A, right? They are separate, number one. And for these ones, you can easily tell from the diagram. For that one, I'm not going to bother you, right? Let's just worry about this column here. That might be something, actually at this level here, it's still very straightforward. You basically just want to see whether or not you can take an epsilon transition from the current state. For example, let's say for Q0 over here, if we want to take an epsilon, what will be the set of states that can be resulted from there? Well, since we got epsilon over here, so in this case, go from Q0, we can only go to Q1, right? That one's easy. And just notice that the, the way you write it is gonna be a set. So that'd be a singleton set, just Q1, just to notice. Quick check. What about from Q1? Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. What about from Q1 over here? Let's say from Q1, we want to take an epsilon transition. What will be the resulting states or the resulting set of states? What would that be from Q1 according to the diagram? Any states? If you don't think there's any state, but you still gotta put a set, right? Empty set. 
because from Q1 here, you don't see any, uh, anything that's epsilon, so that should be just empty. Right, so these are just two examples on, on, about how you can fill out the epsilon transition, that, which will be very useful when we calculate the epsilon closure, which will be in turn useful for converting to DFA. Right, so everything kind of depends on each other. All right, so for this column here, I'm going to let you figure out and also convince yourself. It's already on the slide. Just make sure you're able to produce such transition table for the epsilon N of A. All right. Later on, when we try to convert this epsilon N of A into DFA, we will get another equivalence transition table, except that the column over here, every entry here is rather than being a single states, it's going to be a set of states pretty much like how we generate a transition table for DFA, right? I mean, last time, from NFA to DFA. Are we okay so far? So far, it's still pretty straightforward, right? Just look at the diagram and figure out what will be the target state. And just notice that it's a set. This one is pretty easy. And then you can look at the slides and just do some exercises yourself. Just make sure you can confirm the answer. And the next one, is going to be epsilon closure. Okay, let's now make sure we know how to calculate it. Many things depend on that. Let's say we got some epsilon N of A, we got all the components here, and then let me give you the definition for epsilon N of, uh, so epsilon closure directly. I just call it E-close, just easier to write. It's going to, given a states, you're going to find out its epsilon closure, which would be a set of states. And I can tell you that it's always going to be non-empty. Let's see the definition, a single line definition. The epsilon closure of a single state Q, number one, is going to be Q itself. So that's why I said it's never going to be empty, Q itself. Union with the epsilon closure of any states from Q that can be reachable by some epsilon transition. That's how you put it in English. But we're going to see how we calculate it. OK, just remember, well, of course, you don't memorize it. Just remember how to do the epsilon closure calculation yourself. OK, I'm going to switch to some example over here, and we'll try to do it. OK? That's the definition you can definitely refer to as you're still reviewing it or learning it. How do we calculate the epsilon closure for Q0? Before we start the calculation, let's just make the diagram a little bit larger. Let's think intuitively what epsilon closure really means. You can think about basically epsilon closure means all the reachable states from Q0, including those that can be reached by the epsilon transition. In this case, Q0 itself, and then you can definitely get to Q1. You can also get to Q3 because you can see epsilon, epsilon. And also you can get to Q2. And can you reach any further? Which one? Q5, right? So that will be the ultimate answer. You cannot reach to Q4, of course, because you've got to take something that's not epsilon. So the epsilon closure for Q0 ultimately is going to consider, uh, going to consist of Q1, uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, five states, right? intuitively. And of course, in the, writ in the test, if I simply ask you to give me the epsilon closure, without showing the intermediate steps. You can just look at the diagram and figure out the answer. It's rather intuitive. But if I ask you to derive the result to me, it's going to be another story. I'll show you uh, how to do it. Okay? Just to start with, if you look at the uh, slides, you can see that's the complete calculation result you can look at. But I'm going to do, hopefully, uh, many part of it just to give you the idea. So you can definitely complete the exercise yourself. Right? That one there, I'll leave to you. But let's now try how to derive the epsilon closure. Okay, let's take a look. So I want to calculate the E close of Q0. By definition, the state itself should be included. Q0. Okay. And then it's going to be union with basically the epsilon closure of all the states that's reachable from Q0 by an epsilon transition, right? If you look at the diagram here, <coughs> sorry, let me just uh, 
write some comments over here for you, just in case you need some intuition here. The E close, epsilon closure of all states reachable from P via the epsilon transition. Right? That's uh, how you think of it intuitively. And what we got to figure out for this part here, let's think about what states are reachable from Q0 by epsilon, from Q0. Q1, Q2. Agree? OK, so we're going to do this. So we're just going to do, let's say, the E close of Q1 and also Q2. The epsilon closure of Q2. I'm doing this in a slightly different style as in the slice. In the slice, it's absolutely formal. This one just slightly more intuitive for you to see. You can go either way when you write your answer later in the test. All right? So far, so good, right? Okay. And let's try to figure out this one here. Right? So this one just got to be union ultimately. Okay? That's for this one here. What would be the epsilon closure for Q1? Well, we are applying this definition once more. Definitely, it's going to include Q1 itself, union with the epsilon closure of all the reachable states from Q1 by the epsilon transition. According to the diagram, what should we consider for the epsilon closure further? Q3. Good. If that's what you're thinking, you're absolutely right. Q3. So what we want to get is E close Q3. And do this one as well. And for Q2, that one looks a little bit different, right? What about Q2? What will be the epsilon closure? We can actually terminate this case right away. What's the epsilon closure for Q2? I'll give you a choice, empty or otherwise. Just itself, yes, just don't forget itself, thank you. Right, it's going to be always itself. And in this case, there's nothing else that's reachable from Q2 by epsilon, so just Q2 itself. Very good, all right? Let's go further. What we want to do now is the epsilon closure of Q3, right? So from Q3 over here, we can go just to Q5, right? So it's going to be Q3 itself and the epsilon closure of Q5. All right, let's go a little bit further. And for Q5, you can see for Q5, do we have anything further by epsilon? We don't. So the epsilon closure over here would be just Q5. And we're just going to union all of them together. So Q0, Q1, Q2, Q3 and Q5. So these are the answers, right? I would say if that's kind of the intermediate work you showed to me on the test, it would be acceptable. I know it's just easier to write. The one on the slides, you can feel free. That one is absolutely formal. You can, that's how, how you write a paper, you know, like a formal report. But this one is acceptable. As long as you can tell me after the intermediate calculation, what's the ultimate answer? You should tell me it should be a set con containing one, two, three, four, five, all right? Epsilon closure. All right, let me just uh, write that for you. The ultimate answer would be Q0, Q1, Q3, Q2, Q5. Okay, do we have any question here about epsilon closure? Pretty easy, right? All right. All right, let's move on. After epsilon closure, we can now define the language. Again, we got this delta hat. And now, how many delta hats have we seen so far? This will be the last one you will see, by the way, in the lecture. Right? We have seen the delta hat for DFA. We have seen the delta hat for NFA. Now we've seen the last delta hat for epsilon NFA. They are really defined in a very similar way. For this one here, it's basically almost the same as the NFA, except that we now we have to consider epsilon and closure, all right? 
So what I will do is, for the second one, I'm not going to uh, ask you to think. That might be too complicated. So I would say that one there, I'll leave you to think about it and get back to me if you got a question. Why don't we just do the first one? Okay. The first one here, if it was only an N of A, or think, you know, think about this. Think about what we did before. For delta hat, we have the same base case to deal with in the case of the DFA. For a single DFA, let's say we are in Q, we take epsilon. The result would just be Q. In the case of NFA, you are in Q and you're taking epsilon. The result would just be a singleton set with Q, right? There's a difference there. Now, do you think in the case of the epsilon NFA, if we take epsilon, would that be just Q or something else? Before I point to Henry, anybody would like to? Yes, go ahead. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, just notice the comparison, the epsilon closure, right? Which is what we just did. And for this part here, I'm not gonna trouble you. Why don't we just reveal that and I'll point to you what you should really notice over here. This part here, if you, I would suggest you ca compare this with the delta hat for NFA. Okay, that's what I would suggest. Compare with the delta hat of NFA. What I want to point out is this. So we here we got Q prime, and also we got Q prime prime. Right? I'll just visualize that for you, and then we're done with this. Let's say we are taking X A. As before, x will be a prefix string. A will be a single character. Let's say we are now in Q. We are trying to take x. And then we get to Q prime. And then we take another single character A. We get to Q prime prime. Right? However, we cannot simply just put Q prime prime as the final answer. Again, we gotta consider epsilon closure. Just like here, you cannot just say Q. You gotta say epsilon closure of Q, right? That's something I want you to notice. Epsilon closure of Q prime prime. All right, that's how you figure out the transition, right? Since we have done uh, lots of thinking before, so now this one, I'll just leave you with that. Let me know if you got trouble, All right? And finally, how do we define the language of the epsilon N of A? Similar as before, let's take a look. So let me just get rid of this. So, so we take the string from uh, initial states using delta hat, and you want to make sure the set of states, one of them is actually accepting states, basically. As long as one of them is accepting states, the, the ultimate uh, alternate universe will be accepted. All right? Similar definition as before. All right? Any question about this? Are we okay? Any explanation you needed, let me know. Otherwise, I'll move on. Because I really want to get into the final one I want to get into today, which is about minimizing DFA. That one is the most fun part. Hopefully, we can get there. Alrighty. That's good. And, yep. And let's see this. Okay, so this might be worth a little bit of attention here. How do you process the, either the acceptance or rejection of a string? Let's say 5.6. Okay, I will do part, part of it, maybe and let's see how much we can do, okay? Again, before we get down to the details over here, again, all the details are already on the slides. I might just do part of it so you get an idea, okay? If, if I want you to look at whether or not 5.6 should be accepted by this epsilon N of A, let's take a look informally. Let's say we are in Q0 here. We can take epsilon, get to Q1, and then we take five, and then we take point, and then we get six. And we take epsilon to the accepting states. So it could be, a, it, it should be accepted. That's the ultimate answer. But how do you show it, right? That would be, that would require some computation over here, right? And in order to do it, this, this will be how I suggest you keep track. We have to think about both the uh, delta and also delta hat. Oh, I'll show you. Okay, I'll show you maybe one or two. To start with, you shouldn't consider just Q0. You should really think about 
what can be reachable from Q0 by epsilon transition as well. All right, so that's why for you to start with, think about from Q0, if you want to get to epsilon, right? What would that be? Let me, so that one there, let me use pink. So that one would be a set. Definitely, you got Q0 over here. And also, you can also get to Q1 by the epsilon, right? So that'll be Q0 and also Q1. This will be the starting point. But of course, if you started wrong with just Q0, you'll definitely reach maybe some alternate universe that may not be accepted, right? So be careful. That'll be the starting point. And from here, we got two possible alternate universe, either from Q0 or we can go from Q1, either way, right? Let's say we want to process the first character, five, right? For that one there, just normal transition, okay? We'll worry about the epsilon closure separately at the end, okay? Let's say from Q0, if you read five, do you have any transition to go with just five? You don't, right? Good. I'll write it down uh, explicitly. Delta, you go from Q0, and then you take just five. Union with delta, and then you go from Q1, which would be the second alternative states, and if you want to take five, which would be, and we know very well, this one over here is empty, right? As we said, union with, what about this one here? If we are in Q1, okay, we are in Q1 over here, and then you take five, which will be just Q1 itself, right? Let's put Q1. And this would be just Q1 over here. Okay. Q4, yes, you're absolutely right. Sorry about that. You're absolutely right. Because you can either hit here or here. Absolutely. Thank you. Q1 and Q4 which would be Q1, Q4. All right, so this will be part one, right, without considering epsilon closure. And then from here, before we can process the next character, you have to consider what would be the epsilon closure for Q1 and Q4. So that will be reachable. Those reachable state will be the starting point for the next character process. All right, let's do that. That one there is going to be the epsilon closure of Q1, union with the epsilon closure of Q4. Right, of course, for the individual calculation, we already show you how you can do it. Why don't we look at the diagram just for now, okay? What would be the epsilon closure for Q1? Q1 itself, anything else? Just Q1, right? There's no epsilon transition out, so just Q1, okay? All right. What about the epsilon closure of Q4? Q4 itself, for sure. No epsilon transition. So in this case, it's simple. Q4, so this will be Q1 and Q4. So this will be the starting point for processing the next character, which will be the point, all right? And for the rest, exercise for you, all right? For this part here, to process the other two, exercise. And one thing to note, right? In this case, it's not really showing. You can see after normal transition without considering the closure, it's Q1, Q4. After considering the closure, it's still Q1, Q4. But sometimes you might see some extended elements here, which is why we want to do epsilon closure. Sometimes we might have, right? Just don't forget we got part one and part two. Right, exercise for you. And once you're done, you will definitely see the complete answer over here. And of course, 5.6 will be accepted. All right, and you can try another one, which I will write here, exercises. I'll give you another two. One will be, 0.6. Another one would be plus 23. All right, give it a try. 
And of course, your ultimate answer should be show the steps and then conclude whether or not the string should be accepted by the epsilon NFA. All right. Guys, any questions so far? We okay, right? Okay. I'll take silence is yes. Okay, now let's move on to the last part for the epsilon NFA. Just like how we converted from NFA into DFA, we're going to apply a very similar procedure to convert from epsilon NFA into DFA. We still, it's, we, we call it the extended subset construction. But basically what we need to consider now will be the epsilon closure because it's kind of a, for the reachability from the any states, we definitely want to consider closure. All right, so what we need to do is to figure out some table over here. All right, that's what we should do. Okay. That's the table you will see on the slide. That's more like a solution that's already given to you, right? I kind of uh, block two cells over there, which I want to show you how you can compute them. Once you, once you know how to com compute specifically, sorry, here. This will be the starting point. You want to make sure you get a starting point right. Otherwise, everything else following that will be wrong. And also how you can compute just one cell as an example. And for the rest, will just be computed the same way. And it's lazy evaluation in the sense that you start with something here, you go until there's nothing that's not discovered. In that case, you can stop, right? Of course, in the worst case, it could be exponential in the worst case, but hopefully in practice, you will get something much uh, less substantial. All right. I want to say one more thing here. This transition table here is something we want to create, right? So you can think about this guy here is the epsilon NFA, which we want to convert into a DFA. So this transition table here is the delta of the converted DFA. Right? Just get the context clear. And that is why here you don't see any epsilon. Agree? Because for DFA, you cannot take epsilon, as we said in the very beginning. All right? Let me write it down. No epsilon transition. And one more thing to say, which we also mentioned last time. Every state that's reachable from here is so-called a subset state, which we also mentioned this term uh, last Thursday downstairs, right? So every state in the ultimate DFA correspond to a subset of the states in the epsilon NFA, similar to the NFA to DFA conversion. All right, that's about the high level picture I want to draw to you. All right, let's now figure out how to compute this one here and this one here, all right? Why don't we start with this one here? What should that be? What would be the starting point to do? Q0, Q1, Q0, Q1 how did you figure? I agree. Exactly, that's exactly right, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, just be careful. I think that's pretty much clear from what we have said so far. So I just want to make a note just in case you still have doubts. So this guy over here would be the epsilon closure of the initial states, Q0, right? Which we know how to compute. And how about this guy over here, right? Before, I, of course, you know, answer itself may not be so important. It's really important about the steps. I would say, it would be something we did earlier, just right here, right? I would say divide that into part one and part two for your calculation. You might just be able to do that very quickly. But conceptually, you want to think about two phases. Can anybody just de describe how we compute it in terms of the steps? And then we'll sketch that quickly and we can leave it. Anybody? Henry, you want to suggest? How do we compute that cell? Mm, not quite. No, no, no. You're talking about second phase. No, sorry, I'm uh, Me too, actually. 
Okay, that's okay, don't worry. Anybody? What Henry said about epsilon closure was the second phase, which is good. What about first phase? Robbie? Delta of P U zero comma D. Yes, delta. Mm -hmm. Union delta P U one comma D. Absolutely, that's exactly correct. So we're gonna do well. Notice that that's exactly right, Robbie. Thank you. This part here is under the context for making a transition of a digit, which, well, of course, I'm, do, I'm cheating a little bit over here. Rather than having nine columns to say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 9, 10 columns, I just say any digit D, which is a member of 0 to 9, right? That's just, convention, uh, just a notation. So step number one, let me put it here. Step number one, you want to compute delta of Q0, from there you take a digits. Union, as Robbie said, delta of Q1 taking also a digit. And you're going to get a set. All right? From there, you're going to do epsilon closure, like what Henry suggested. Second step would be, from there, you got individual member there, you're going to get an E-close of everything you will see here. That's the conceptual steps you want to take. And I would encourage you guys to really do it because that's so important. Right here. That's the step. Of course, again, I'm being very formal here using the generalized union, but it's okay to just separate them into individual union. That's okay. All right? Which, whichever way you, you feel free, uh, you feel comfortable. Right? But the ultimate answer is going to be Q1, Q4. All right? Do we have any questions so far? And by the way, that's it about converting from epsilon N of A to D of A. Since we already know how to do from N of A into D of A, we're only extending it with the idea of epsilon closure. That's what we did. Robbie. How do you, how do I know what, what to take? Oh, the final states, yes. Basically, uh, you mean accepting state, is that what you meant? Yes, very good. So now, oh, that's very good, that's a very important question, which will be highlighted in another slide, but let's talk about it. Let's say these are all the reachable states you got, right, over here. Now, this one apparently will be the initial states. This one here will be the initial states Q0 of the D of A. That one's easy. And we got how many subset, how many subset states do we have? One, two, three, four, five, and six. Six of them. And which one should be considered as an accepting state? Any subset state there which will intersect with Q5 will be considered as accepting states. So you think about in the source, epsilon N of A, Q5 should be accepting, right? In this case. And Q5 is here and also here. So these two will be considered as the accepting states in the DFA, which can be a set, right? Which can be multiple. So these two would be the accepting, it's a very good question, accepting subset states. of the DFA. Okay. All right, any more question about this conversion here? Right? We're almost complete in terms of the picture about converting between notations. We got one more, which is about how you can go from epsilon N of A, sorry, how you can go from regular expression into epsilon N of A. That'll be the last one, okay? Let's now go back over here. All right, so this part here, it's uh, formal stuff, just more like a formal summary, all right? What I will do is I'm gonna move to onto iPad. I will just highlight certain details you want to pay attention to, especially to see the correspondence between the formal stuff and the example we just did. That's all I wanna do, okay? But you guys should really look into the details a little bit more and think about it. Let's take a look. 
Okay, so this is the formal stuff you just saw on the slides. All right, that's formal stuff. And this is the conversion we just did from epsilon NFA into the corresponding equivalent DFA, right? We want to see the correspondence very quickly. Let's start with something simple. The alphabet between the DFA and the alphabet of the uh, NFA, they are the same, zero, one. Uh, actually, will be the digits and also plus, minus, and et cetera. Alphabet is really the same. What about the starting states? Now, how do you see the correspondence? The starting state will be, you can see one will be Q0, the other one will be Q0, Q1, which is exactly the epsilon closure computation we did, right? That's uh, Q0. And then what about the final state, which Ravi just asked? All the, subsets, all the subset states, which has some member that's accepting state in the epsilon in a way. They should be considered as accepting, right? That's this one here. And this is how we express it using set comprehension. I'll leave you to read into the notation, okay? The next two over here is the more interesting bit, okay? I'll just give you some intuition. First of all, if you look at this, this is to say, how do we characterize all the states in the corresponding or converted DFA? This will be the set comprehension notation we have. All right. Can, well, how about just this one here? Can anybody try to, don't, don't read the math to me. Everybody can read it. Give me the English sentence. What does this line is really saying? We are saying all the states for the corresponding DFA, which is essentially over here, that is equal to this particular set comprehension. And that set comprehension uses the delta hat from the NFA. Can anybody try to give some intuition here? What's really being computed here? And that's really the computation we did when we did a lazy evaluation. I'll just let anybody want to try, and then I'll correct it a little bit, and then I'll just tell you how I think you should phrase it. This one here. Anybody want to try? We can start with something small. This one here is to say every state in the DFA is a subset of the states in the epsilon NFA. It's a subset state, right? That's how we start with, okay? That one's easy. That one there, I'm just gonna say, each DFA states is a subset of states in the epsilon NFA. Right, you can see, for example, subset, subset, everything's a subset. What about the second part? And there will be a typo I need to fix. This one here should be conjunction, not implication, because that's exist. I'll fix that, all right? What does it really, so now we talk about the set uh, the, a single state in the DFA should be a set of states in the corresponding NFA. But what about the second part for the existential quantification? What, what does it really say to us? I'm pretty sure you, know you can recognize this guy, right? Yeah, let me just explain this and I'll point to William. This one is to say W is a string, right? Obviously. William, go ahead. I feel like it's roughly trying to say it's everything reachable from yeah. Q0, which bothers me because it feels like why are you only starting from Q0? Should we be starting from everything? Yeah. Notice that we are using absolute, oh, sorry, we're using delta head. Delta head itself will consider epsilon closure for the recursive case and the base case. So that's why when we say delta hat, taking from Q0, you want to process some string. 
And if you apply recursively the definition for delta hat, that one is going to handle all the epsilon closure at all the levels. That's why we can start with Q0 rather than the epsilon closure of Q0. All right. Basically, this part, okay, let me just say that, and then we should really conclude this one here. So this part over here is really to say all the subset states reachable from Q0. And when we say reachable over here, we are applying the definition of delta hat. And you just remember in the delta hat definition, which, which we just did, that one day is going to consider both cases, recursive and base, base cases, which will definitely consider E close. Right? All right. So we kind of build up, you know, build things up. And finally, for this one here, just by, by taking some single transition, that one there, just take epsilon closure. Right? That one's easy. So I'm not going to trouble you. All right? Yeah. Do put some thoughts into this one here. I think the math is not that bad. I mean, it's really kind of using what you learned from the previous math course, but now it's applying to a different context. All right, any more questions before I move on? We okay, right? Okay, everybody's okay, I presume. Let's now move on. All right, so now we want to talk about the final kind of conversion we want to have, okay? How do we do regular expression into epsilon and of A? Right? For that one day, we got to draw. Right? Grab a piece of paper, just get ready. Right? I'll describe the principle to you guys, and then I got one exercise we'll do together. Just, yeah. This one is fun. Let's do this one here, and then we will be ready to take some attendance, and then we go to the topic about minimizing. Okay, good. Yeah, regular expression to epsilon and of A. So we want to define this kind of mechanism recursively, which means we're going to have some base cases where we got simple regular expressions and we can draw the corresponding epsilon and of A right away. We also got recursive cases as well, in which case we're going to build on top. We'll see. Okay, so now there will be some important properties you want to remember. Because when you draw the, let's say you're given some question on the test, you have to follow this particular mechanism. This mechanism guarantee there's only a single accept states, not multiple, just a single one. To make this mechanism work and also amendable to some implementation in Java, for example, you have to make sure there's only one accept states to make it easy. Okay, just remember. One single start states and one single accept states. No incoming edge into a start state, that's obvious. No outgoing arc from the accept state, that's also obvious, right? All right, so just remember these principles. So these are the properties of the diagram I'm going to show to you. All right, let's now take a look, okay? Base cases, okay? Let's try to draw. Oh, not, not your turn just yet. We'll do that in one exercise. So the simple regular expression will be just epsilon, empty, and also some symbol that's from the alphabet. All right, the first one, epsilon, remember one single star states and one single accepting states, right? And we just have an epsilon in between. That one's easy. So if you're given a regular expression epsilon, that would be the corresponding epsilon N of A. That one's easy, right? All right. What about this guy here? This means empty language, not accepting anything. How do I draw the corresponding epsilon in a vein? Yes, no transition in between, right? Good. Star states, accepting states, but Nothing in between. That's exactly right. All right. 
And this one here should be quite obvious, right? Well, of course, you got to make sure A is really a member of the alphabet, assuming that's the case. So that would be start states, accepting states, and then there should be a transition, but it's going to be A. Base cases, simple. And let's now talk about recursive cases. You will notice that the way I'm going to draw, especially for the first two, they correspond to how I illustrated of the two ex uh, the examples. Let me remind you very quickly, okay, very quickly. Remember from last time, when I talk about these two, by introducing epsilon transition, that kind of corresponds to how we deal with recursive cases. Given some N of A, given some N of A, how do we combine them together? That's basically what we're going to deal with right now. All right, just remember, I'm just drawing some connection. Let me go back. There we go. So this one is to say we got some epsilon N of A for this regular expression R. We got some epsilon N of A for this regular expression S. Let's say we got those two already. Now, how do we create the corresponding epsilon N of A for their union? Well, plus, all right? Let me stop by drawing the following. Let's say we have some, when I say box, so that means inside the box, it can be arbitrarily complicated, okay? So by in this box, remember the property we set. It's guaranteed. You got exactly one accept states and exactly one uh, start states. That's something you gotta remember. So we got some, so this will be R. One start states and one accepting states. Something like that, right? And there might be something else in the box, but we just omit that. It's not important to discuss that in the principal level. And also we got another box for S star states, accept states, okay? So we got them individually. How do we combine them to correspond to plus? We want to build another epsilon in a which has exactly one accept states and one star states. What we want to do is something like, this will be the star states for the ultimate epsilon N of A. This will be the accept states over here. And we want to say we can go either way. Either this or that should be acceptable, right? So we can say this will be the new accept states. And then that one there will be connected to over here. And this will be connected to over here, epsilon, epsilon. And then these ones no longer are the, uh, are no longer the accept states, just normal states. And they will be connected to this artificial or contrived accept states. That's the union. So how do we read it? From this, accepts, uh, from this start states, you can either go this way, which will accept R, or you can go this way, which will accept S. Either way, it's gonna end up in the ultimate accept states, right? That's union. Concatenation is gonna follow something very similar. Let's say we got R here. I'm gonna draw slightly differently. R here, start, accept. And then we got S over here, start and Accept, all right? Similar input. Now, how do we draw the corresponding epsilon in of A, which will represent the concatenation, okay? We have star state here. Oh, sorry, let me draw carefully. Star states, accept states. And then this will be the new star states, which will be convert, uh, connected to the star state for R using epsilon. And then the accept states of R will be connected to the star states of S, epsilon. And then this is no longer accept states and then be connected to the ultimate accept states, epsilon. Concatenation, right? Just using epsilon. Yeah, some of it is pretty easy. But we'll do one example together just to make sure. R star is an interesting bit, all right? Let me draw R first.
are star states, accept states, right? Now, how do we draw the corresponding epsilon and of a? With one star states and one accept state. Let me set it up first. Star states, accept states. And if you remind yourself about what R star really means, that means R may repeat for zero or more times, right? What about zero times? Zero times means I can simply go to, from the star to the end, epsilon, right? Or I can say I will connect to the star state over here, and then somehow this will be reachable to the accept states. That'll be one uh, repetition. It can be as many as we like. So that means once we get, let's say once we get accepted for one repetition over here, we can still go back to it for the second repetition. And then as soon as we want to end the repetition, we can just go to here. So that's basically what you will have. Yeah, that's exactly what you, you will see in the slides. Any question about the principle? We okay, right? Hopefully it's not too big a jump. Can you draw this? Why don't we, why don't, we uh, why don't you take two minutes, please? And then I'll draw that on the iPad to get with you, all right? For those of you who might be a little bit confused about what this is about, I'll give you a little bit hints. You may want to consider this one first, and then star, and then concatenation, and then concatenation with this. That'll be my hints to you, all right? Yeah, at least get this, get a feel about how to draw this. It's definitely not difficult, but you just gotta be careful about the procedure. <clears throat> All right, just another 30 seconds or so, and then we'll just keep your answer there, and then I'll draw that uh, to right away. Okay. Okay. Why don't we try? How about how to draw zero? Zero would be, you know, since, let me do this. It's going to be some, let me, okay, let me do this. Okay, that'll be better. Zero, right? And this would be one. And how about zero plus one? It's going to be something over here. And then something over here. I'm not really drawing that as an accepting state just yet because we might need to be connect, uh, want it to be connected at some point. And we're gonna do star, right? So it's going to be something here to start with, something here, either no repetition, or it could be as many as you like. That's zero, one, zero plus one star. All right, so what's so good? And then we're going to do concatenation with one. 
Eh, let's draw one first. It's going to be one. All right. And then how do we draw concatenation? For that one there, let me move this a little bit. A new star states. And then connect in the middle. And this will be another accept states. All right, and finally, finally, we got zero plus one. And for zero plus one, I think we got enough. So here you can simply do zero plus one, do the epsilon n of a, and then do the concatenation, and also concat. Okay, do these two. You can complete the exercise, and that's what you will see. In the slides, right, that's kind of individual, right? Individual step, and right? that's the ultimate one. Over here, All right? Compare that. If you got any doubts, let me know. Any question before I accept states? Hmm. Oh, I see what you mean. I think that one there e is redundant, yes. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, if you think about this guy, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, I may need to fix this slide a bit. Let's say for this one here, we are concatenating this one here with this one, first of all. To concatenate them, according to the principle, you have to introduce an extra state. That's just according to the principle. So I don't think the diagram on the slide is exactly right. Let me review it. If I need to change it, I'll let everybody know. Okay, good. good. Hmm? Yeah, you know, actually, one, one thing to point out. So this mechanism here is guaranteed to create some redundant states, for sure. That's why the next step is to minimize the number of states of the FA. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. So guys, I think uh, this one's fine. And then uh, I'm going to, I may have to change this a bit. And if I need to, I'll update the slide and let you know. Right? But you follow the same principle. Okay. Any other, other comments other than this? Everybody's okay? Okay, good. And now let's now go on to the next topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this diagram here, you know what, I simply got it from some textbook. Mm -hmm. it, it, I think that's, yeah, that's actually mentioned, it's actually referring to this. You know, I will give you the email of the book author. Maybe complain <laughs> to him. If I were if I were him, I wouldn't draw it this way. I agree. I absolutely agree with you. How about this? Let me see what I can do. Either I can, I, I, I maybe I should redraw this in a in a way that I, how you should draw it in the test. Let me do it. All right. Okay. I'll get back to you guys for sure. I agree. All right. Let's now move on to the last topic for today. Okay. At least I want to give you guys an intuition and the algorithm, and hopefully we can get through some part of the example, and then we just com uh, will complete it, which will be rather quick on Thursday. Okay, minimizing DFA. And before that, I want to remind you a diagram that we did when we first introduced the lecture. Let me just go to that diagram, give me a moment. I'll just find that diagram on my iPad, just to remind you where we are. It should be, there we go. If you remember this diagram, right? What, what, uh, what have we done so far? Given regular expression, you can convert it. You can draw the corresponding NFA, or actually to be more precise, it should be epsilon NFA. And then 
it can do the subset construction from epsilon n of a into d of a. And now we want to talk about two more things, okay, two more. One is, given this d of a, which uh, is not guaranteed to really have the minimum number of states, so we may want to substitute some optimization process, which is to minimize the number of states in this d of a. That's what we're going to talk about now. And then, once we get to Thursday, I will also conclude about this lexical analysis about, let's say you get this optimized DFA. Maybe the source was simply some regular expression. Now, how can you implement this DFA? I'll give you some code skeleton to consider. But just remember, even though you're going to learn about the code skeleton in the, in the lecture, in practice, let's say for your project, or for your assignment number two, you don't really have to implement that scanner yourself. It can be automatically generated. It's a very standard process. But for the, your knowledge, we should know the theoretical foundation for that. All right, that's a big picture. All right, let me go back to the slides. And I'll get that ready. Oh, why don't we take attendance quickly? And then you guys can take a one minute break. Bear with me, I just need to refresh my location, which is Saver. <clears throat> yeah, meanwhile, I just get your eye clicker ready. So what I will do is I'm going to view the course online. Yeah, slightly slow. Okay, there we go. Settings and attendance. Don't require, require to fresh. There we go, and save. All right, and then we're going to say, start a class. And then I'm gonna do a poll and then I'm going to post that. All right, now you guys can do it. You mean by you or by me? Yeah, hopefully you appreciate it, right? I hope, yeah, no problem. You know what, in, in some way you might be right. I could have asked the TA, you know, just to, you know, or, you know, somehow to take attendance. Or I, I just add 5% to everybody at the end anyway. Uh, maybe not, yeah, yeah. Are we good? All right. Guys, actually, I don't think any one of you actually took an in-person class with me before, right? Before the pandemic. You know, interestingly, I was watching my 4302 lecture from winter 2020 right before the lockdown, I found that the microphone I'm using now gave much better quality in terms of the voice. So I'm glad I changed it. So you guys are, yeah, you guys will just get the benefits anyway. All right, thank you so much. Let's now go back to, yes, question. You have a problem? Okay, why don't you come over very quickly? Yeah, yeah, I will just deal with that and take one minute uh, break more and then we'll, uh, uh, do you have, yeah, sorry about that, yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Yeah, do you have a pen? Yes. Okay, I already closed it. So uh, why don't you just put, yeah, just put your last name, first name, student number. Okay. Thank you. And just signature as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. No, if you don't mind, I'll just write very quickly. Right, okay. 4302, I clicker. Yeah, today is October 4th, right? Right. Yes. Good. Thank you. Um, I had this problem last time too. It just doesn't connect. Like. Yeah, I think uh, there's something. Uh, try to see if we can resolve it. Maybe at some yeah. point, we should, we, yeah, hopefully we can get it to work. But don't worry. You know, we can always take attendance like that. Yeah. 
All right, guys, we'll start in one minute. Okay. Yeah, I'm curious, any one of you have already gone over the Antler 4 tutorial? Antler 4. Okay, that's okay. That's fine. It will be your study item over the week, reading week. I'll write it down. Okay. You, you're not supposed to, but I'm just saying some of you may have. All right, we should start in just one moment. All right. All right, let's now resume. Okay, so this will be the second last topic for this lecture. So we talk, we'll, I don't think I can finish completely this topic here. I'll give you some intuition about the algorithm and why we are doing it. And also we can start converting, well, start optimizing the first example DFA. We'll try to continue on Thursday, very brief. And then we definitely will go into parsing on Thursday. That'll be the plan, right? So why do we do optimization by minimizing the number of states in the DFA? Right? Regular expression, which, which is what we just did. Go to epsilon NFA and go to DFA. It's no guarantee this particular DFA has the minimum number of states possible. Sometimes memory might be a very sensitive, uh, like a sensitive resource in your system, in which case you have to worry about numbers, number of states, all right? And then, well, so this is just an example here. Basically, there will be scenarios where you may just have to worry about whether or not your DFA contains no redundant states. That's the main motivation, right? And we're going to see how we can minimize the DFA, okay? I think I want to just start with some simple sketches about some ideas and then do some very abstract draw and then we'll go over the algorithm. That's hopefully at least what we can do today. And then on the, at the start of Thursday, we're gonna do two or three examples just to make sure, all right? Now, I wanna sketch the idea a little bit. Let's not worry about the algorithm just yet, okay? Let's say the following. The input, oh, you know what, before this, I think that'll be a better idea. Sorry about that. This is the algorithm just called minimize DFA states. Let's just worry about the input and output first, and then I'll give you the intuitive sketch. The input here is simply a DFA, arbitrary. The DFA itself can either be something you just draw directly, or it could be a DFA that's converted from some regular expression. Either way, just any DFA. Of course, the DFA contains uh, Q, sigma, delta, etc. just DFA, right? The output here, I just call it M prime, just another DFA, which may or may not be the same as the input. That DFA, uh, that M prime here has the following uh, property. Both are important. Number one, its number of states, which would be cardinality of Q, should be the minimum possible. Number two, the behavior of M prime should be the same as M. Both are important. Now, question for you. What does it really mean when M prime is the same as N? Do you see my question here? I'll put it down. All right, we just talked about the input N and also output M prime. My question to you, number one, I got several check. Number one is what if M prime, the output is exactly the same as M, the input. What does it really mean? First of all, is it possible? Intuitively, it is possible. Good, I agree. But what does that mean? Yeah, which means after running the algorithm, you still generate the same M prime as N. That means your original input M has been minimized already. It's possible. 
right? That's important, right? You don't necessarily will get something just smaller, not necessarily, right? Sometimes just want to get fewer states might compromise the behavior equivalence of the output, all right? Number one, okay? That means no optimization could be done. It's already optimized. Number two is So I'm saying the cardinality of the states of M prime is strictly larger than the cardinality of the states in M. Is it possible? Anyone think that should be possible? So you guys don't think that's possible, right? Why? Why should that, why should that not be possible? What does it really mean if that greater than relation actually holds. What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Right, guys, you just sanity check about algorithm, right? That's something you should know. <laughs> Sorry, you may, sometimes I ask, ask question may not be so difficult. Don't overthink. So this one here tells you, you're supposed to minimize the number of states by giving more states. Of course, obviously that's wrong, right? algorithm not achieving what it's supposed to. Okay, yeah, these two are sanity checks, just to make sure, all right? And I want to mention very briefly about the equivalent part, okay? For this part here, the second condition, if we really want to justify that formally, we have to do some equival equivalence proof about the algorithm, but we, we're not gonna do that in this course, okay? But the way we're gonna talk about the algorithm on Thursday, we're gonna make sure we justify informally why this algorithm will work. We'll generate some DFA that will simply got equivalent behavior, all right? Okay, so I want to take just about one or two minutes. I wanna explain some quick idea, and then we'll take it up from there. Let's say we have a DFA input, which got S0, S1, S2, S3, four states. So the transition itself is, under, uh, is unspecified. You don't need to worry about, okay? This will be the input. There will be some very important idea for the algorithm called partitions, all right, partitions. And I just want to cover these two, first of all, right? and then we are done for today, okay? Ultimately, you want to create some Q prime, all right, Q prime. And Q prime here is going to correspond to the states of the uh, output DFA. That should be minimized, all right? See you guys? All right, good. All right, so, okay, Q prime, okay. And what will be the smallest partition? The smallest partition would be something like this. Maybe it would just be a single partition. S0, S1, S2, S3. You can think about a uh, this will be just a single partition. A single partition. And on the other hand, let's say Q prime could also be equal to Let's say there's no optimization we can really do. So the resulting DFA will just have the same number of states. In that case, we got exactly four partitions. So we got partition number one, partition number two, partition number three, and also partition number four. So this will be the case where no optimization could be done. because the resulting DFA simply got 
also one, two, three, four. Each partition correspond to the states of the ultimate uh, optimized DFA. Right. So I just want you to get this intuition about partition, and we're gonna see on Thursday, right in the beginning, how we are supposed to work out the partition. Right. All right, guys. Thank you. And then also on Thursday, make sure you come because we need to mention what you should do during the reading week. And after the reading week, project. That's gonna be fun. That'll be the most fun part for the course. All right. I'll see you on Thursday. Take care.